Hey there, folks. This is Mitch Spano on behalf of Red Path Consulting Group. I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about Salesforce, particularly triggers, what they're used for, you know, what are some of the sticking points and, and what's a way that you can consistently create your triggers to make sure that you avoid things like trigger recursion as well as uh, order of execution problems. So let's dive right in here. Uh, triggers are a little bit more advanced than some of the declarative functionality. So uh, triggers are written in Apex code. So if you want to process your records before or after uh, inserts, updates, or deletes, and you just have some simple things you want to do, I might recommend sticking with the process builder. But if you have some more complicated logic, trigger is the way to go. Trigger is, is the tool that will get that done for you. So here we are at our home page. Um, I'm going to navigate over to schema builder and show you what we're working with here just in a test developer org so that way you can see and get a little bit of context. Okay, so we have the account object uh, standard object and then I just created a custom object called custom object underscore underscore C. Okay, so and it has a lookup relationship called account to account. Okay. Sound good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, let's just say that we have some logic that we want to run, uh, that we wanted to execute on the custom object. Uh, and we wanted to do it before, let's just say before inserts, uh, before updates or after updates. Okay. What I'm going to do now is I'm gonna open up the developer console and let me show you what a trigger is and how to create one. Let me see here, new Apex trigger, we'll call it uh, sample trigger. Okay, and the, on the S object of, call it custom object. Here it is. Okay, cool. So this is how a trigger looks when you first do it. It's going to be, start with the word trigger, the name of the trigger, sample trigger, and it's going to tell you on which object are you working on this trigger? And then you're going to pass it the context. Now this could be on insert, this could be before insert, could be uh, after insert, um, it could be before update, and it could be after update. Let's just say we're worried about after insert, before update, and after update. Right. So it could be before or after inserts, updates and deletes. OK, now, typically, if you just were starting out, you might just want to say, OK, um, well, the, the way that you reference your list of custom objects that you're working on is the variable list dot new. So we would say list of type custom object. We'll call it uh, new list equals trigger dot new. Okay, so that is how you would reference all of the new things that you are about to insert or about to update or have updated. Okay, so this is how you get to the list. Now, there's a couple of things that we want to do here. So let's just say that this is our first trigger we've ever written. Uh, let's just say we wanted to select from uh, select uh, a bunch of accounts that are the parent accounts of these and call an update on them. So let's just go like this. ID uh, list of type ID because we're going to need the IDs in order to query for them. Uh, we'll just call it ID list equals new uh, list of type ID. Okay, now let's loop over all of the custom objects for custom object. Call it CO, that is an element of new list. Okay, let's, let's process that now. So for all of the custom objects that are within the new list, let's add the parent account ID to the ID set. So I, or excuse me, ID list, ID list dot add co dot account. Okay, so now we have all of the IDs for the accounts. Okay, so let's just, let's just say we wanted to uh, create a list of type account and query for all of those IDs, right? So 
um, update list. Select ID from account where ID is in the set of the ID list. And then update the update list. Okay, cool. Now, see, this might look like it works here fine. And, and your first time building a trigger, this will probably get you by. However, let's just say we went like this. I'm going to keep that and I'm going to change it to a list of custom objects. Okay, select ID from custom object. Where ID is in the ID list, I will comment this list out. And let's just say that instead of adding the accounts ID, we just added the custom objects ID. So after we insert, basically, we're going to then query for it and update it. Let me see here. Oops, forgot the underscore underscore C. Okay, so, but the problem is here that when I call update on this update list of custom objects, we're going to get this trigger to execute again because we've defined the context as before and after update. So not only will it execute again once, it'll execute again twice, and then each time it executes twice, it's going to execute two more times and two more times and two more times. So this will run almost to infinity, right? So this will recursively keep updating your list until you hit a governor limit, okay? This is not the required functionality that we want. So, and furthermore, uh, there's a little bit more of these trigger variables that you may or may not be familiar with. So in order to make sure that we have all of our context taken care of, all of the variable or all of the trigger variables accounted for, and that we don't recursively update or recursively execute this trigger, I'm going to show you the framework that we always use here at Red Path in order to write our triggers. Okay, so I'm going to open up this custom object trigger. That's what it's called. So notice here we have all of the contacts are listed, right? And then we also have this check. So it says if check recursive dot run once. Okay, and check recursive is a very, very, very simple class. And all that it does is it contains a private static boolean uh, that gets set to set to true on the first time that you run it. Otherwise, it will be false. So this right here is just a boolean variable that's used. So that way, the first time it does it, this executes to true. So then it will execute the entire block that's contained within this if statement. But the next time it goes, this check recursive, since it holds a static variable. Uh, a static boolean will be set to false so this will not run none of this will run again okay so that's how we make sure that we don't have any recursive triggers on any of our objects okay now i'm going to zoom past this line here but uh notice that we had all of the potential context listed up up here so now what we do is we check the trigger context variables okay and we make sure that we have one for every scenario then the final step that we do in order to make sure that we can process this logic is we write a, another custom class, okay? And this one is called custom object trigger handler, okay? And we instantiate it right at the top before we get into any of the if statements for our context. So let me show you what the custom object trigger handler looks like, okay? All that it is is basically a listed out version of places where you can insert functionality for any given context that you want. And then now you also know the, the variable names that you have in order to work with, right? So before insert, I know that I can only work with a list of new custom objects, okay? Now you also, certain times uh, after insert, will give a map that will map the ID that the ID to the custom object that you just inserted. Um, so that's different for every, for every context, what you have access to, but it's all listed out here in this custom object trigger handler class. So what we do in our trigger is we create an instance of this class, and then we just call the on before insert or on after insert. We just call the method that really tells you the context 
uh, and then that will handle the logic here within the trigger itself. So if I went to back to our sample trigger, and let's just say I took this and I copied it, and let's just say that I wanted it to hand to go after update, after update, I copied it into here. Then what's going to happen is this, this will get ran, but it will not get ran recursively because we made sure that we have the check recursive check at the very top of the way that our trigger is handled. Okay. So this will run one time and it will never run recursively on the same object ever again. Okay. Now this works great. And this is a really good way to make sure that all of your logic is handled in one place. Now, there's nothing that stops you from writing two triggers on the same object, right? Notice here, I have sample trigger on, on the custom object, and I have custom object trigger on the custom object, right? Now, when you have multiple triggers on the same object, you're not guaranteed the order of execution that you may or may not want. So the best practice is to always just have one trigger on that custom object. So I always create one trigger and always have to make sure that it always has this framework. Now, furthermore, um, we make sure that we have the check recursive class and all of these are done. So the advantage of, uh, the advantage of doing everything here is that way you have, you can call inner classes here. You can call other classes. Um, and you can, you can handle all of the complicated logic in one spot. Uh, the order of execution of the functionality will be guaranteed to be what you define it as such in each one of these methods. So if you have, uh, another, Apex class that you'd like to call. So let's just say we had a, an update Apex class, which, uh, you know, it, it instantiated with a list of custom objects. Let's just, oh, we need to change this to list new. Let's just say that this update Apex class was a static class and we passed it in, a, in the constructor a a list of custom objects, then you could call that right here. You could also define an inner class um, and then call that inner classes functionality here as well. Now, advantages of this are, like I said, no recursive updates to any of your objects. And then you also have a single place in order to make sure that all of your logic is handled properly and in the right order. Now, there is one caveat to this design that I want to make sure that you're aware of. Okay. Now, if I went to this custom object trigger, all right, and I had, actually, let's go back to the sample trigger. Let's just say that we went back to the list of accounts instead of custom objects and we're trying to update them. Now, in this particular scenario, let's just say that I was a user and I had, um, you know, performed some DML statement on a custom object. So after insert, let's just say I had inserted a custom object, but my profile did not have the permission to update accounts, then this update statement would never execute. Okay. That means that the triggers will always run in the mode of the current running user. So the trigger will inherit your permissions. Now this is true for anything from the standard Salesforce graphical user interface, any DML operations that are made from a visual force page, as well as any DML operations that are made from an API. So if you log in via data loader, or if you have uh, some sort of some sort of API call that updates or inserts or deletes records, then the trigger that would handle that context then runs with the permissions of that user. Now, classes, however, such as the custom object trigger handler class, always run in system mode unless you specifically call that out. So that would mean that let's just say that I was a user and I had, you know, just updated a custom object and I did not have access to update accounts. The class would update the accounts for me. So that's a very important thing to note that this will bypass your permissions and will allow you to do a little bit more complicated logic. But as a developer, you should be aware of that because security is, is is big and we want to make sure that your the integrity of your sharing model is maintained when you create functionality using this framework for triggers so you might need to use methods such as is creatable or, or things like that to make sure that your current user actually has the permissions to do the things that you are defining within the context 
of your custom object trigger handler. Okay, so um, if you have any questions, please shoot us an email. Just check out our website at redpathcg.com. Check out the contact us section. Um, but otherwise, this should be a very, very reusable framework for you. And it should help you, especially if you are new to writing triggers. So thanks for sharing some time with us today. And I hope that you learned a lot.